leaves tastes good like a beer should. You said it. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. <laughs> Try a frosty cold glass of Bavarian right away. What's that you say? No boulder dash or baloney here. Yeah. Cheers, everyone, and welcome to the Unfiltered Gentleman. And now, with a higher BAC than your ABV, Greg, Scott, and Dan. Hey, everybody, Greg here, the Unfiltered Gentleman. We're back down in San Diego, La Mesa, to be exact. We're revisiting one of our favorites. We're here at Helix 8101 Commercial Street in La Mesa. Uh, DrinkHelix.com, Helix Brewing Co. on the social medias, and now Helix Sourworks on social media as well. With me is the man behind a ton of beer, Cameron Ball. Cameron, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, before we get into the main reason that we're here, which is this new second, even not nicer, but uh, more barrel-filled building, Yeah. Uh, let's recap for the people. You were on Batch 58. We talked a lot about Helix, and Helix opened in 2015. Correct. And you guys are making tasty beers. At the time, I think... You'd either just stopped working your outside job or you were about to stop working your other job. I'm still about to, but I still have it. So yeah, three years later, still have it. All right. A uh, lot, of, lot of breweries still doing that. <laughs> Give us a quick history on Helix before we get into Sourworks. So Helix opened in August of 2015. Right away, I started to uh, you know fill, fill wine barrels with uh, the goal to you know try to get into more of a fermentation side of things. Uh, Helix beers are mostly, you know, it's a clean ferment. You can push different grains, um, different hops and things like that. Yeah. So I wanted something where I could explore more of, you know, getting different tastes and stuff off of uh, fermentation. And so that's why I started to fill up wine barrels. Um, I got the first load in November of 2015, so only okay. a couple months after opening. Yeah. And uh, started packing the first space just with sour beer, just filling barrels all the way up to the top. Got to the point where I fit 73 wine barrels in there on the production floor. It was very tight. Yeah, uh, I bet. Couldn't really move with the goal to open what we have now is Sourworks right, right. next door. And we were here, I think, for the first time, uh, well before you were on the show in January of 2016. Okay. And I remember you were like filling barrels and fill, you know, filling them up with water, you're, like steaming them or something. Yeah. And... So the first barrels were filled in December of 15. So you okay. probably came right after uh, the first two were filled, which we'll drink after. January, I was also starting to fill the rest of them. So I think I got about uh, 60 or so that first batch. Yeah. And uh, those were the ones that you're seeing. That's really cool. So, I mean, these have been going for a while then. Exactly. Yeah. So the first time that I was on the show and, and you saw that, you're actually going to taste the beer that went into those barrels like three years ago. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so Sourworks. Sourworks is right next door to regular Helix, if anybody's been to Helix. Yes. You walk down the hallway, Helix to the left, Sourworks to the right. has a very cool uh, wooden door with Sourworks on it. Yep. When did Sourworks officially open? Sourworks opened in October, so October 20th of 2018. Okay. And since then, uh, we opened with 12 sour beers on tap. Everything is uh, from the barrel, aged anywhere from 8 to 36 months. And what we're doing primarily here is exploring uh, different fermentations, different, you know, some spontaneous, some are, you know, controlled pitches that we mm -hmm. can get into later, just to kind of learn about the different types of beer that we can make with different brewing techniques. Nice. Yeah, we're going to get really nerdy on this one, talking about different cool. souring techniques and all that good stuff. Cool. Before we move on, let's, uh, should we crack open our first one here? Yeah, let's do it. What do we have in front of all us? All right, so the first one is called Big Dreams. Okay. Big Dreams is a single barrel batch moved into keg, so it was not a blend. It's a non-boiled sour beer, so it went uh, straight from mash right into the oak barrel hot. Interesting. Uh, where it sat as it cooled down just with like paper towel over the top of it, so it takes about two to three days for it to cool down. Okay. And then that's when I pitch the different bacteria to it, different sac strains. And, so this never got up to bacteria. like 215 or whatever, never hit boil? No, this probably maxed out around 
I mean, sparging temperature is 170, so your grain probably doesn't really exceed 165 overall. Wow. Um, so, yeah, probably the most that this uh, beer got up to was 165. Do you run any, I don't know, risks by not boiling it? You do, but, I mean, with risks, you know, you're kind of jumping into this side here of trying new things, new techniques, doing things that others aren't doing to see what type of tastes and what flavors that you can get. There's no real right or wrong way to make beer. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, find a way that works with the process that you have, see where it goes, try new things. And that's what I'm about here is just always exploring new methods to make beer. Yeah. This has a um, nice kind of white wine-ish aroma to it. Yeah. Something really interesting about this, and maybe you can tell me why, it has a lot more of a malty flavor than most sours. I can really pick up the grain. So Big Dreams clocks in at a whopping 3.5% alcohol. Woo, getting so, tipsy. Yeah, super, super low alcohol. Yeah, it's a good football beer. Um, yeah, but it actually went straight into a once-used sher sherry barrel. So what you're getting there is a lot of that wine notes off mm -hmm. of that barrel. Um, that was a non-rinsed sherry barrel. It okay. was just came straight. We didn't do any... Any hot blasting, any ozone, nothing. It just came straight to us, and it was instantly filled. Okay. Um, so you're getting a lot of that oakiness and a lot of that sherry wine taste that's going back into this beer because it is so low alcohol, very yeah. light. I mean, it's a, almost like clear beer. That's why you're getting a lot of it. Yeah, that's really nice. Now, when you say you, it went fresh into the sherry barrel, are we talking like it was still wet when you got it with sherry in it? Or? Yeah. Uh, down the street, we have a winery here, San Pasqual Winery. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll just get a text and they'll say, hey, we have an empty barrel that's going to be open in like whatever, an hour or two. Do you want it? I'm always <laughs> like, yeah, sure. Why not? And so I happened to be brewing that day, you know, just went straight into it. That way, if I went in a little bit hot, I could kind of, you know, swell anything that if it leaked, I didn't know what the condition was with it. Mm. Um, if it needed some higher temp to kill anything that you know, might be in there that I don't want, sure. but also to get that hot to cold swing to see if the bacteria that can survive in that 160 range. I know uh, most of them don't, right. um, but maybe some of those would thrive and that would make this beer what, what it is. And so when you don't boil like this, do you get like a really high starting gra original gravity? This came off of oh. our sparge. Okay. So I was brewing one of the Helix beers, mm -hmm. barge that all the way through. And then, you know, when I go to then dump runnings at the end, instead of going those down to drain, I basically hooked up a hose straight to the oak barrel oh, that's and cool. then went, went into that. That's even better because if it didn't work out, that exactly. nothing really lost at exactly. that point. Exactly. That's really fun. Yeah. Um, all right. So Sour Works, the building... Why uh, why go with the second building? Which, by the way, if anybody's been to regular Helix, uh, Helix is gorgeous. Sourworks follows suit. Thank you. But why the second building? So second building here, um, we were getting pretty tight with space to store all this oak barrels. If you ever came in before or look online or anything, it was packed. I was having to brew all the clean beer, having hoses go underneath you know, racks of oak. Um, when I would wash kegs, I couldn't even almost push the button to start the wash cycle each time. <laughs> it, was, it was that tight. So for me to continue to get more oak, I definitely would need more space. Yeah. Our cold box for Helix is small. We just pour, you know, straight off our tanks here. All the kegs are stored right there too. So to start to roll out all this beer, I would need more cold storage space. And I thought, you know, okay, the best thing to do is just to move next door into the same look of the space, red brick, open ceilings, and build a place that I could store all of this beer and, and have elbow room to, right. you know, to play more with, with sour beer. Yeah. Is it a little, um, I don't know, sigh of relief not having all this bacteria next to all your clean beers? I'm not super concerned with... Having bacteria beers next to it, I did it for three years. Um, I wasn't working on them actively and transferring around, but I do pitch bacteria sure. into oak, you know, right next to clean beer. You know, same day that I do it, I try to work on, or I, I do work on clean beer first, sour beer second, if it's the same day, right? Um, versus the other way around so that any cross-up wouldn't happen. Yeah. That way I would take the bugs home. 
right. you know, maybe take a shower that night right. and then uh, the next day be clean. Do you ever have any uh, issues, any crossings? We've had no issues. Nice. Yeah. So three and a half years now, no clean beer down the drain and everything's been flying out that side. So I don't put something out just to do it. You know, right, it really passes that test. And then all the sour beers, um, some are unique, but my goal here is just to make sure that everything comes out clean, nothing infected or, you know, super gnarly here. Yeah. General question for Helix. General, do you have any hazies or have you done any hazies? We do not have any hazies. I beers. didn't think so. Yeah. Everything's super clean here. And uh... yeah. So, I mean, just real quick off topic for <laughs> ha- hazies here. Please go for it. Um, we don't do any specifically hazy beers, but... We do have a couple beers that are dry hopped in a certain way. Um, I do everything under pretty large pressures. Mm -hmm. And I found that the hops are actually starting to infuse into the beers more and they don't fall out those oils. Okay. So it's something that I've been playing around with for the past couple of years is, you know, how far can I push my fermenter pressure during those hopping additions? Interesting. And I found that a couple of those beers, they they have that haze the Mm -hmm. entire way through. It's not the yeast haze, but it's a very very hop haze and when it comes off that tap and nu- nucleates you smell all those oils instantly Interesting. so it's not really like a hazy beer right um based on you know your grain bill or yeast choice it's all you know cal ale clean yeast but the ways that the hops are added they're getting more infused right into the beer and what do you do just load the the tank with co2 or uh so yeah so dry hopping under pressure and then um i do a lot of capped dry hoppings so the tank is getting upwards. I mean, they're rated for uh, 14.7. Okay. I take them up to about 18. <laughs> so yeah, it's a little scary, especially when the PRV blows. Right. But I'm confident with the tanks. All our tanks came from Portland Kettleworks, and uh, they do hold a, a lot of pressure. That's really cool. Yeah. What are some of the pains and heartaches that you learned the first time around that you you didn't repeat when you opened the second building oh the pains the first time around <laughs> second time i just knew get it done as fast as you can because uh-huh. any time spent just kind of having to think of something or taking too long just starts to get, get at you and you know to operate a day job operate a brewery that's open right keeping the production up and at the same time, having to build this new place out, I knew that I just needed to get it done as fast as I can to kind of get things back on track. It was just a lot of focus doing it. Um, what was nice with the new place is I tied in the same look with everything. Yes, very so, much. So, you know, concrete bar, cold box that you can see through, bright tanks in it. And as far as the um, sour work side, there's not too much infrastructure that you need, like installing a brew house um, or right. fer- fermenters. It's just more open space, a lot of, you know, hose bibs, mm-hmm. um, a lot of floor drains. So things like that um, didn't take as long to do, like installing an actual brew house. Yeah, that, that makes it nice. A lot yeah. less plumbing, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. And are they basically ran as two separate places? Do you have this one staffed at the same time Helix is staffed? We staff the sour work side uh, Thursday through Sunday. You can drink beers here mm-hmm. pretty much any day that we're open. The other days you can kind of like float in and chill, but you know the other person at the bar will jump over here and you know pour both beers. Get a little workout. Yeah. All right. Speaking of beers, what do we have next in front so of us? So the second beer we have is called Leslie. Leslie. Leslie gets her name because the barrel written on it was... Leslie. Oh, fair um, enough. <laughs> yeah, so that's where it came from. The owner of Piketty Winery up in Cupertino area, mm-hmm. her name's Leslie, and uh, she's the one who gives me all these barrels. I thought, you know, this is also another single barrel batch, no blend. I'm like, what do you call this beer? Well, the barrel says Leslie <laughs> on it, so that's the name. So why not? Yeah. Yeah, this one has a, a lot uh, milder aroma than the first one and more, I guess I'd say, fruity flavor to it. Yep. Yeah, so the way that I describe this for the board, it's a soft, lingering, late sourness Mm -hmm. um, and has a lot of like rose petals to it. I can see Um, that. Very, very soft, you know, nothing super intense. So these two first sours, Big Dreams and also Leslie, they're our most, uh, we'll call it tame ones. Okay. These are the beers that I would just drink, you know, glass after glass. Progressively after this, we get a lot more sour. Okay. A lot more complex. And I would say Leslie is more tame yes. than the other. Mm-hmm. Um, what's ABV on this one? Leslie also clocks in at a whopping 3.5. <laughs> all right. So another all-day football drinker. Exactly. Very nice. Exactly. I think these ones stayed in barrels. I'd have to check the dates, but 
Um, these are some of the first no boils that we did. Mm. Um, single barrel batches, no boils. Leslie does have a lot of Lacto D, uh, Sac Brett, and PDO. So okay. we use a lot of PDO here, some in more amounts. Uh, some are only PDO barrels mm -hmm. when we get to the blends with a Brett to it. But just trying to do these no boils and putting in more more like a blend of different Sac yeast, Brett, and also Lacto. Yeah. So is this another one where it's uh, the runoff from the sparge? Or Correct. Do you Correct. remember the, the beer that it was originally? Um, they usually come off just some of our IPAs, some yeah. of our double IPAs. That way our runnings, and you know, we go in a little bit heavier on that, and uh, we only start to fill it if our runnings are actually high that okay. day. Which is easier to do with a double IPA. Exactly. If I was build. brewing like a pale ale, you know, I wouldn't be able to run anything off into oak because right. I'd get like a one percent beer right yeah <laughs> be oaky water at that point yeah 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 both sides tend to always have so much beer on tap how are you keeping up with the demand yeah so i'm always impressed by your tap list tap list management is something that i've learned people like to have you know a lot of different options but not too many so on the helix side we have 12 taps 12 taps allows us to have a couple lagers a couple wheats you know, a lot of IPAs, hop, hoppy styles, and also your darker, you know, your short, sure. Schwartz beer, Porter Stout. On Sourworks side, though, instead of having 12 taps, I had 28 taps. Wow. 28 taps helps because uh, we have seven that pour right off of the tanks that okay. we blend into. And then the rest are straight off of kegs that are either bright tanks that go into kegs or single barrel that mm -hmm. are going right into that. Um, so about one wine barrel will give me about, um, three half barrel kegs plus six dull. Okay. So what I can do then is I can always have one of them on tap to carb, then the one right behind it on a line to carb also. So first one carbs and pours, mm -hmm. the backup one is just to carb. So when the first keg is done, then we just jump those lines. So we always start to carb up the next beer. Okay. Makes sense. When the front beer is being poured. Yeah, I would imagine there's a lot more turnover in here because you're doing single barrels and that there sort of are, thing. yeah. Yeah. Opening with, you know, twelve beers though, it's not like people just like crushing these beers like you would a pale ale. You know, they're a lot more <laughs> sipping them, you know, more like wine. Yeah. Um, it's harder to slam a sour. Exactly. Exactly. So then also like the to go here, um, some of the stuff we don't have to go. Uh, we only do it on the stuff that we do blends of. Okay. Is everything here at Sourworks Barrel fermented? Is there any kettle sours? Correct. Nothing here is kettle soured. Okay. Get nerdy for us for a little bit. Talk about the difference between kettle sour. Okay. So and kettle fermented. soured is uh, you go through your normal brewing process. You know, you mash, you sparge, you um, you know bring it up to temperature. Right. You can either boil it, then cool it down, and then cool it down and hold around you know one twenty ish, and that's when you add your lacto or you know some even throw in you know, handfuls of grain inside like a hop sack okay. um, just to get the bacteria in there. Oh, okay. Hold that overnight in the kettle for anywhere, you know, 24, 36 hours, we'll say, until um, you reach your desired acidity. Bring it back up to a boil and then cool it down into the fermenter and go through, you know, regular, you know, house yeast strain. Okay. So what you're getting is you're getting a lower pH beer, more acidic sour beer without the risk of contaminating all of your cold side fermenters because everything was in killed off when you reached boil back in the kettle. Mm -hmm. Our side here, though, nothing is soured in the kettle. Everything goes into oak where it's then pitched. Um, I've done a couple where I do a primary ferment with a sack strain, whether it be like a Belgian strain. These past uh, couple weeks, I've been filling about 60 wine barrels of a, uh, a Belgian Saison base okay. that we pull at about eight points high. So like eight Play-Doh, 10 to 30-ish, mm -hmm. and then put that into oak. And that's when I add different Brett strains. Okay. Um, so with those five batches of beers, I'm learning about the different Brett strains and how they affect it with the same base beer. So it's a rye Saison base, different Brett strains such as, you know, Brett Lambicus. So yeah. Uh, Brett C, Lacto Brevis, um, some have PDO in it, some Brett Brooks. So just different batches. They all don't get the same ones, um, but each batch of six is getting the same dosage. Okay, interesting. Then my plan with those beers is to hit those with fruit after, we'll call it primary with bacteria is done. Sure. Then give it some more fruit about two to three months before it goes into bright tanks to serve to then give 
the bacteria one more chance to eat that fruit okay. there. So you don't, you wouldn't like clean the fruit first, right? You'd put it in with whatever's on it. Yeah. So what we're using here, um, just based of our process is, is puree. So I get it all, I think it's Oregon fruit for brewing.com oh, okay. or something. Um, I get it from them. Um, everything comes aseptic clean. Um, so I can put it right into Oak. And so maybe our next couple beers that we'll drink, I have two, uh, fruit beers here one with passion fruit and one with uh, raspberries. So oh, okay. those will be the next two so we can kind of taste some of the ones that have fruit back into them. All right, cool. Should yeah. we give those a try? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So speaking of fruited beers. Speaking of which, uh, we have two beers with fruit in here that actually have fruit added to them. Okay. First one is Future Futures, which is passion fruit. And the second is Two Emotions, which is raspberry, red okay. raspberry. Both of these beers start off in primary steel with a um, Bavarian ferment. And then I add fruit on that day that they're going into oak. So after they reach, you know, almost terminal, I clean all the oak barrels. Everything's neutral, clean, been ozone, you know, steam ozoned, CO2 purge. And then right before I start to fill, I dump all the fruit into the top of the fermenter and then rack straight out of the bottom with the intent that hoping that the fruit doesn't have enough time to settle out. So every barrel gets an equal distribution of of fruit to it. Oh, okay. That same day, I then pitch the bacteria right into the oak mm-hmm. um, so that the fermenter stays clean and tuck it away for a couple of years. Wow. So these ones actually had the fruit in it for the majority of the life. I'm also experimenting on other beers in here where I'm going to add the fruit, like I said, two to three months prior to it going to cold storage. And just see the difference? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So future futures. You get a huge just passion fruit nose. People think of it as mimosa beer here. Oh, yeah. Um, it's just, you know, super fruit. Even looks a bit like a mimosa. Yeah, really easy to drink here. These two beers are flying out of here. That is phenomenal. And I was a little afraid because sometimes when people say passion fruit, I run the other direction. Yeah. This is this is like drinking a mimosa on Sunday morning. Like yeah. This is so... But still very dry. Yeah, very dry. What's the ABV on this one? Uh, Future Futures clocks in at 5%. And two motions is also 5%. Yeah, not dangerous because uh, I could drink a, a whole lot of these. Yeah. Uh, you talk about uh, you were steaming the barrels and all this stuff. So when you when you go through cleaning the, the barrels like that, does that mean your goal is to only get the oak flavor and, and nothing of what might have been left behind? Yeah, so our process starts, um, we get wine barrels usually up north from Piketty Winery. Okay. Fly up to San Jose, rent a U-Haul, um, <laughs> fill it up. I think I can fit about 60-something in a big U-Haul, mm-hmm. jam-packed. Drive to slow, sleep in slow that night. That's where I went to school, San Luis Obispo. Right. Party there, wait, wake <laughs> up, and then drive the uh, rest of the way down. So, yeah, we're starting with barrels that have either a C- Cetobacter in there, Brett mm-hmm. in there. The winery does mark it with different X's. They put, like, X's and A's on the stave or, oh, like, okay. the, the uh, heads and stuff. So, you know what you're getting with it. Yeah. So, we know that something's up with them, and that's why they don't want these anymore. So, what I do then is um, some of them have to be re-swelled so they leak. Mm-hmm. So, I have a hot pressure washer here. And that's what we saw you doing all those years ago. You were filling them up with hot water. And- yeah, so I have a, uh, I have a P- Poseidon. It's a uh, Poseidon hot cart um, hooked up to a very robust uh, tankless water heater here. Mm-hmm. And that has, then it uh, converts it into high pressure. So we go at a 185 Fahrenheit. goes into this like high pr- pressure spray ball that goes inside the oak barrel upside down Mm -hmm. sprays every direction i think in 30 seconds it hits pretty much every square inch oh cool so that's also can scrape the inside whatever junk was stuck on the inside from the wine if that wine barrel sat for you know a few months sure um scrapes that out also steams it to swell then after we see that it's all sealed up and swelled we fill it with ozone water to then also check that it is sealed So we can fill that up, you know, halfway full if we want to. That goes on our uh, wash rack where we can actually spin that barrel around filled to test all sides that it is sealed. Oh, cool. Dump that out then. And then it goes on to racks where that then gets an ozone gas to it. Mm. So these things go with a high temp steam, then ozone water, then ozone gas with the intent to kill whatever 
was in there that the winery did not want before right. I add back into it something that I do want. Okay. We also have a couple beers up here that are spontaneous beers mm -hmm. that we can touch back on when we get to those beers. So okay. some of these uh, don't get cleaned, but some of them are cleaned neutral barrels so that we can have a uh, clean beer to start and then we can put the different, you know, bacterias in it that we want. And maybe you don't even know this answer, but why would a winery not just take those steps of cleaning it and doing all that stuff and reuse the barrel? I'm not sure. I've never worked in one. My guess is maybe it's lived past its life and it needs to rotate on. I mean, some of these are from 2012. I have some 2009 oh, wow. marks on it. Maybe they don't get any oak off of it then. So they have to always, you know, re-add to their cooperage. So as they add, they have to get rid of it. So they probably just pull out the ones that they don't want. Okay. And that's the ones that I get, right. which works well. <laughs> yeah. And I love that you just go up and get a U-Haul and drive it down. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. When you open that thing after it sat in there for like a full day, the whole <laughs> back you open, you just get this like blast of red wine to your face. You're almost drunk just by the fumes. that Contact come drunk. Yeah. Yeah. You're like no matches over there. Right. Please don't pull me over. <laughs> yeah. I swear I haven't <laughs> yeah. been drinking. Oh, geez. Yeah. A lot of these are very low ABV. Is that due to like the uncontrollability of wild ferments or, or did you do that on purpose? Um, it starts more with preference. Um, over on the Helix side, I brew more of, you know, lo lower alcohol beers. Anything from our lowest, I think, is three, mm -hmm. seven, highest, like seven, five, eight. Yeah. So nothing too out of control. I like drinking something more in the the five, six range. Yeah, especially if you're like going to drink all day. I like to drink a lot, lot of beers, right. um, not just, you know, one or two that are high, you know, big boozy beers. So that's why I like to keep everything low. I've also found that over time, if it sits in oak and it's has more alcohol in it, you get a lot more off flavors to it. Oh, does it kind of eat the oak up a little bit? or Something happens with the alcohol and those bugs in there. It's not as stable. Mm -hmm. So just looking back on like everybody who, you know, wins awards for beers, most of them are kept in that 5% range, something like that. Something that's in like the 12s is more of like coming out of more like a barrel aged stout, something right. like that. Something imperial. But yeah, for sour beers, I like to drink everything low and have a few of them. So it's on purpose. It wasn't yeah. just like I, I can't control the yeast or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Interesting. Most beers kind of start with, you know, how much grain that you want to add in right. to get that alcohol that you want. A lot of these beers here have a very big um, either wheat based or have a lot of oats in it to get some more of those long chains that we get so that the bacteria can eat that over time. Okay. What's the next? So this one's the raspberry one, Yeah. Right? So Two Emotions is a primary ferment with a sack strain. And then same thing, uh, barrels are prepped and purged. And then adding the raspberry straight to the fermenter, same day we rack right into oak, right out the base to fill all those. Mm -hmm. Once they're in oak, um, it gets the bacteria. And the bacteria in this one, Brett Lactopedio. And it smells like you're sticking your nose into like a jar of jam. Yeah. Nice and fruity. But very dry. Yes. Just like the last one. Yeah. Very dry and has a little like tart finish at the end. Mm -hmm. Nothing like those first four beers, they don't get you in your cheeks. Right. But the next one, you're going to you're gonna get that <laughs> get that cheek worked. Nice. Yeah, this one, once again, has very mimosa-like qualities. It's dry like the champagne, and yeah. it's, it's as if you had a raspberry mimosa. Yep. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, very easy to drink. Good intro beers, those first ones. Mm -hmm. The next one we're going to try, they're going to get more complex, robust. So, yeah, let me go pour those right now. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so now we have uh, our, f our first beer that we ever brewed here, sour beer-wise, um, Walking Through Windows and Delayed Promises. Walking Through Windows is a blend of six barrels into one of our bright tanks. Okay. And that has a, it's a Sac Brett Lactopedia. It goes into the oak. It goes straight from the kettle right into the barrels. Um, where it gets hit with that bacteria, blow off hoses and everything into buckets. So it does all of its fermentation and souring inside oak from day one. Wow. And it smells like whiskey or scotch or something. Yeah, it's it's got like a very, very good like, yeah, dry wine oakiness. It's been sitting for three years in oak. So uh, you are getting a lot of that oakiness coming through. Yeah, a lot of oakiness beer. on the nose. Definitely taste the oakiness. Also get a little bit of sweetness from from the grain bill a little cereal like quality to it yep and this is definitely one of the first kind of 
puckery beers that we've had today. Yeah, yeah. So I describe this as a complex phase sourness of ripe peaches. Um, with notes of uh, dry wine, oak, caramel, and maple syrup. And that is like a lot like sipping on a nice whiskey yep. or something strong. You're like You would not want to pound that at all. No. But it is nice to sit that here That one comes in on. at 6%. All right. So one of the higher ones yeah. on this side of the... And so then that same time that I brewed, I went into uh, from the kettle. Kettle-wise, we brew like 10 barrel batches. Typically, I'll go in like 14 barrels worth. Okay. You know, 14 and a half. Uh, if I'm going straight into oak, I can max it out at about 14 and a half, 14.75. What that means is I can fill a true seven wine barrels straight off the kettle. Mm. Um, so that's how I was able to do six for the blend for w- walking through windows. And then this one that we have now, Delayed Promises, is a single barrel um, just with Brett Brooks in it. This one is a lot softer. Yes. Doesn't make you a pucker like the other one. A lot of uh, softer aroma as well. Still get yeah. a lot of that barrel flavor from it, though. Yeah, so Brett Brux is like a traditional Belgian sour strain. It's just a golden sour that sat for 34 months in oak. This one is a lot more like drinking a white wine. Mm-hmm. Where the other one's kind of like drinking a bourbon or something. Yeah, yeah, whiskey sour or something like that. It's got that sweetness to it coming through from the caramel and the oakiness. Yeah, that is yeah. quite pleasant. And so then next we have... I began to uh, really see what I could push sour beers with heavy lactose strains Mm -hmm. and also um, fermenting in oak at higher temperatures. Okay. Typically, when I'm going into oak with like, let's say straight from knockout right into oak barrel, it won't see any steel. Most of them, if I'm going to do a primary sack strain that's also in oak, Mm -hmm. I'll knock out at your, you know, traditional 68 degrees. If I'm going to fire something off in oak with large lacto, I've been going in somewhere more hot around like 95 to 100 straight into oak and then putting that lacto in first. Okay. Um, do they like, does the, the bugs like the higher temp? They do. Yeah. That lacto takes off real fast and then I chase it about... One day after, that's where I'm adding the Brett strain to it to actually ferment it out. Okay. So lacto kind of gets the first thing, then the Brett comes in when the oak's probably at like, you know, 75-ish, and then they get to work, and then it goes through the lifetime of, you know, sitting there for anywhere for eight to two years, and that's where the Brett really can start to take over. So yeah, two beers, pretty much the same base here on this one. One's golden, one's dark. Very heavy wheat uh, grain mm-hmm. grain build to it, yeah, almost to where that. the mash is getting stuck each time. Oh, really? Yeah. Pain you really got to watch it. Bit. You really got to watch it. So you're saying these two have the same? Uh, similar grist bill, uh-huh. um, similar bacteria, same la- okay. lacto strain, different Brett strains. Which is interesting because obviously people listening can't see, but one is very blonde-like yeah. and the other one is extremely dark. So yeah. that's, that's uh, sciency and nerdy. Speaking of sciency. I, you know, I know a fair bit about the brewing process when it comes to normal beers. I know nothing about making sour beers, especially before today. Can you just get a barrel and fill it with wort and not pitch any yeast and have it ferment of, off of whatever just happens to be in that barrel? You can. So um, the last beer that we have here called Betting on Stars mm-hmm. is a true spontaneous beer. Oh, okay. I'm jumping the gun. Yeah, we don't have any cool ships here. What I do is I try and do that. Same style right into oak. Okay. Betting on Stars gets its name from first, it came from a port barrel. Mm. So that's where you get stars and whatnot, you know, navigation type thing. And yeah. then Betting on Stars gets its name from the spontaneous side. You don't know what you're going to get. So it's a spontaneous beer in port barrel. What you're getting from here is it was a, um, a dark rye base beer that just went no boil, sparge, right into the port barrel, came again from the neighbors at San Pasquale Winery, went in really hot, uh, just with a towel right right over the top so that, you know, bugs don't fly in it, and uh, went in at like 165, and within about three days, it started to um, fermenting over, put put the airlock on it, checked it in about 12 months, and we were like, wow, this beer is awesome. (laughs) And what we've done since then is, is I've took out some of the beer from that barrel to pitch into other single barrels down the road. So we do have that random strain going through some more beers that we have that are in okay. oak now. It is very dessert-like, like yeah. a port would be. Obviously not as thick as a port, so don't go into thinking you're drinking actual port. But 
a lot of that port smell when you stick your nose in there. And- yeah, so the way that we described it here, um, it's a prolonged complex sourness with notes of maple and tart plums. Okay. Yeah, I'd get all that. And I don't think we gave this one a fair shake on the tasting. What is this one called again? Uh, Scream with me. Scream, Scream with, with me, me was the one right before, and that was uh, that was the heavy lacto style beer that gets fermented with lacto first at a higher than normal temperatures, and then the brett goes in after that. So Scream with me starts off with lacto brevis for about uh, one day, and then I pitch in uh, brett lambicus and pedio after it gets down to about uh, seventy five. That almost has like a uh, a roasty like quality to it. I don't know if I'm just pulling that out of thin air, but... Different types of bacteria will give you different flavors. Mm-hmm. Some of it gives smokiness. Yeah. Uh, different strains of lacto, i found, that do give that Interesting. smokiness to it. So it's not from the barrel, not like an, a charred barrel or anything? No, it's not It's not from the barrel because uh, Scream With Me is actually a blend of six different ones. So we're not getting as much oakiness out of it that we think because it is a black beer base. We're using a lot of Black Prince malt, mm-hmm. which is just like a, a high roasted wheat okay. to go in hand with the large wheat that we use. So something you might use in like a Schwartz beer type of thing? Correct. Okay. Yeah. You talk a lot about uh, blending and single barrel. It, it sounds like we're talking about whiskey or scotch or something. All this Is it kind of the same idea where you either have a single barrel of beer that hasn't been mixed or you have a mixed barrel of beer? Yeah. So um, when I start pulling barrels, most of them start off with the same base beer, you know, same brew, Mm -hmm. same pitch. I go through and sample off of each barrel, test them all, take notes. And if one is just this like standout star or doesn't fit with the rest, whether it be good or bad, if it's bad, it goes down the drain. But if it just doesn't have that same characteristic and I want to showcase that one, I'll pull that one out, put that straight into kegs Mm -hmm. and then blend the other five. Okay. Just to kind of round them out a little bit. Yeah, if everything tastes pretty much the same, you know, same characteristics, and I say this this will go well with everything else, mm-hmm. they all get the blend. But something like uh, when we did the first two uh, Walking Through Windows and Delayed Promises, mm-hmm. my first goal was I'll just blend in this Brett Brooks with this other strain to kind of get the two characteristics, but that was so unique right. that I didn't want to blend that in to hide that, so I pulled that one out. And put that one straight into kegs. Interesting. Okay. Do you guys have like blending parties where you're sitting here with eyedroppers? And- yeah, it's just, you know, wine thieves and we just, right. you know, pull them out. Gosh, before opening, I think I was doing at max like 15, 20 samples in a day. <laughs> and anything more than that, like you can't really taste it. Especially with sour. T- taste it accurately. So yeah. I try and keep it, you know, to five or 10 max in one day. Um, and then split those up over time, not just hit them all at, at one time with some sort of break in between so your palate can actually readjust. Mm-hmm. Is there anything here that you can actually reproduce as far as any of the beers you have on tap? I hope so. So I'm glad you asked that. When we emptied, let's say, six barrels go into one of our tanks to blend, I instantly rebrew the same base beer, whether it be a golden sour base with, mm-hmm. with high wheat red base with high oats or darks with high wheat and i brew that and then i go straight from kettle right back into those same oak barrels that had that same whatever funk that was in there the bacteria in there Mm -hmm. that blend of yeast and bacteria that made that first beer so that's where that's now going to sit for you know one to three years okay something like a walking through windows that's a blend of six it went into bright tanks Mm -hmm. and then that Basically, next day, I brewed a same golden sour base and went straight back into those oak barrels. Okay. No rinse, no ozone, no nothing. Just went right back into it. And within a day, fermentation. Oh, so it worked. Yeah. <laughs> and have you tried the, the second batch of it? I haven't tasted any second generation barrels yet. Okay. Because, yeah, we, we just opened in October. So I was filling those in... Uh, Early October, and I really try not to dip in to the sure. two barrels here. I don't have any nails. I don't pull nails here. Some do. Uh, the wineries say with the nails, you can pull it. If you have negative pressure, you have oxygen come in. I'm a fan of just, you know, make the beer, put them away, 
and do something else, you know, mm-hmm. don't, don't go in to try and taste and do all this stuff. Um, sure. It'd be real nice if I could just walk down the line, pull a nail and, right. and drink beer. And if it was like that, I'd probably drink a lot more of the beers here before they're done, <laughs> but it's not too hard to get, get your thief, you know, make sure you have a good sanitation practice right? and, uh, going through the top maybe once a year I go into it max okay. twice if I really want to. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of these I've only dipped into about once each year. Kind of just making sure nothing's gone bad or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where did you uh, learn all your sour nerdiness from? Just reading about stuff, talking to other brewers, uh, drinking beers, reading li- labels, what's in it, um, reading the descriptions of different bacterias. But what I found is um, it comes down to a lot of your brewing process and how you use the bacteria. Mm-hmm. Like I said, process is the most here. Being in such a small area, fermenting in oak straight off the bat, you're going to get a lot more effects than someone who's doing the same thing, say, on like a clean steel side. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's more trying to see what process works for you with the space and the gear that you have. Right. And then use the ingredients that you can to achieve the beer that you want to shoot for. Makes sense. And do you have, and this could be yours or someone else's, do you have a favorite sour beer? Favorite sour beer? I'm a huge fan of all the Barrelworks beers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, those guys make great beer. Jim and Bo up there, they're just like... They know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. They're super passionate about it. You know, they're down to share ideas, down to talk beers, always happy with what they're doing. Their beers come out awesome all the time. And you cannot go in there and be like, I don't like that beer. (laughs) Everything is just going to be awesome there. Yeah, it's pretty safe bet. Yeah. I hear... I was doing some internet stocking before. Yeah. That you guys don't do flights at Sourworks. Correct. Yeah. I mean, our flight, so we have two different size options. Mm-hmm. We do uh, five ounces and 10 ounces. Um, so when most people think of a flight, you know, it's like either a set flight or they come in and say, can I get a splash? Right. Everything here is true barrel aged, barrel fermented beer for one to three years if someone were to come up and say can i just have a little splash of you know the sour beer their first sip is going to be like i don't like that this is weird (laughs) but it takes you those first two three sips to really adjust to it to be like oh i pick up all those notes and so that's why we don't go through with the splashes because you might be thrown off from your first little taste of it Mm -hmm. but after you really you know take two to three sips you're going to start to really enjoy what goes into it yeah especially if you just came over from the other side and you just had a pale ale and you come exactly. over here and yeah. get a splash of a sour that's going to be a real kick yeah. in the teeth yeah what's awesome though is it's good to go from side to side so you can have you know sour beer then a pale ale or you know some sort of dark beer whether yeah. it be porter or stout and then come back you know Cleanse and the it's just in between yeah it's li- literally you're just like walking out one door through the other yeah um so yeah beers can cross side we see a lot of others that come into one side with groups you know some are drinking sours some are drinking all the clean beers mm-hmm. so it's a really cool mix here now to have so many options of beers to try not just all your clean beers or all your sours you got pretty much every beer that you can try here yeah and right now you have what total of 24 24 on top holy crap everything's brewed here that's insane yeah distribution between either side are you distributing outside the area at all i would say no other than a local bar sends me a text and said hey can you bring a keg of anything that that you like yeah and I say, sure, you know, it'll be either tonight, <laughs> late after work, right. or, you know, this weekend. And um, that's about all the distribution that we do. Everything here is a lot of on-site. Um, our emphasis here is to create the atmosphere for people to drink the beer in a nice place, yeah. treat the beer right ourselves, uh, not getting into d- distribution, packaging, you know, having it sit elsewhere, whatnot. And then also with that, Two, it keeps the beer prices low. I think we're some of the lowest sour beer prices that you can find. Yeah. Just because, you know, we keep it all in-house and that effort to put it into a package, you know, drives the cost up for a consumer. Sure. My whole goal here is just to, you know, just to make everything affordable so everybody has fun and comes in here, has a good time drinks good beer, you know, good good times. Yeah, you're talking about uh, making a nice environment to come drink beer. I, I think I've gone on an enough uh, tangent about <laughs> this on the last show, but this is like our favorite brewery to come drink. It, it's gorgeous. Uh, it's red brick and, and very industrial and lots of wood, and it's just 
it's one of the coolest breweries. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Sour Work side is all lined up with rows of oak barrels. Yeah. Just looking down, everything's being filled now and then stacked up. And yeah, in here, I think we have about probably about 150 wine barrels. I think I have 19 that are empty to be filled in these next couple of weeks. Yeah. And then we can max out in here around 350 wine barrels. Wow. So depending on what you want to see, one side you've got uh, the tanks and all the uh, brewing equipment. The other side you got barrels to look at. Exactly. Exactly. Everyone's happy. Yeah. One thing we didn't get to do on Batch 58, which I've, I've now started doing, is asking all the brewers a set of rapid fire questions. Okay. So this is just first thing that comes to your mind. Don't think about it too long. Okay. Just off the top of your head. What was the first beer you drank? First beer I drank craft beer. Just beer in general. Firestone beer. Firestone yeah. Walker. What was the first beer you ever brewed? First beer I brewed was an IPA. It was a extract in college. One of those like thirty-five dollar. Right. Get a bucket. Get your extract. Uh, I don't know two ounces of hops because you're like, <laughs> what are these things? But you have to have it and just throw in some like old yeast. You know. Hope it's still good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is the first beer that you brewed and sold? First beer brewed and sold. First beer brewed at Helix was uh, Red and Active. Okay. And then we, but we opened with eight on tap. So there are a few, a few others that were sold first. Okay. Are you a fan of cans or bottles? I like cans. Yeah. Yeah. Cans, they're lightweight. You can, you can crush them too. That's right. always fun. Have can, will travel. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite beer food pairing? Oh man, I really like fish. I eat a lot of fish. Uh, fish in any th beer goes well. I mean, beer with anything just goes well with, you know, whatever. It always makes makes you happy. Um, sour beers with fish or if I'm doing like, uh, you know, steak and stuff, something dark mm -hmm. is, is good. I've been drinking a lot of Schwartz Beer Lady. Nice. Uh, it's Tuesday night. What are you drinking? Pale ale. Either our pale ale here, which is just like super easy to drinking, or Puff Puff Pale, which, which is San Diego pale ale. Very hoppy. I drink a lot of low alcohol beer mm -hmm. here, um, so I can be up early that next day. <laughs> what is your beercation destination? Beercation destination? Uh, Belgium's rad. Nice. I've been there, uh, I think, two times already. Mm -hmm. Want to go back another like 10 times. Yeah. There's just so much awesome beer there cool styles to drink from different techniques to learn food's good there chocolate's awesome beer <laughs> everyone's super nice yeah and it's good weather to drink into you nice. know not too hot there yeah what is your favorite outside so non-helix or sour works beer probably anything new i've been haven't really stick into a certain style i'm always branching out to try something new whether it be like a new can or a new release mm -hmm. um i don't really drink too much outside beer say go to different bars and stuff because right. i'm always doing stuff here whether it be first job or third job <laughs> um so if i do go out it's always anything new but i like to really try something with you know newer hops mm -hmm. or you know some sort of just basic pill ale okay yeah What's your favorite non-beer hobby? Non-beer hobby. I like hiking with my dog a ton. We always do like sunrise hiking really early. We're the only ones out there. Catch a good sunrise. Everyone's in traffic, angry, and we're just like, you know, on the trails <laughs> by ourselves. And he's all stoked. I'm stoked. Um, so, yeah, I, I do a lot of the, you know, trail running, hiking, things like that. And if you follow at Helix Brewing Co., you'll see a lot of those pictures. Yeah, the dog yeah. Out on the trail. Yeah, sometimes the dog gets in there. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, what is your favorite word or slang for being drunk? Being drunk, getting loose. Right. Yeah, whether it be like you're loose because you're feeling good or because you just start to dance, you know, you're just, <laughs> you're just getting loose. I like it. Yeah. Uh, 8101 Commercial Street in La Mesa, a little east if you're heading to San Diego, a little northeast of downtown. Uh, Helix Brewing Co. on the social media as well as Helix Sour Works on social media. Drinkhelix.com. Did I miss anything? That's it. I mean, yeah, we just love doing what we're doing here. We're a small group just trying to learn about different types of beers and just making beers and having them so you guys can also see how they're made. All of our board, our signs say what bacteria is in there. Mm -hmm. So if you ever want to come in here, if you're going to think about a different bacteria strain that you want to use and you want to try it, we list everything right up there so you can really start to compare what you like rather than it, this just be a sour beer with X and Y. Yeah, no you secrets. You really know what's in there. Yeah, that's cool. No yeah. secrets and yeah, you're pretty open with everything. Yeah. 
All right, Cameron, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks one last time to Cameron for opening his doors and sharing his delicious beer with us. If you find yourself on a beer trip to San Diego, do yourselves a favor and stop in and have some amazing sours over at Sourworks, and then you can go right next door and get some clean beer at Helix. There's always food trucks and live music going on, so check out the website or social media for more. Drinkhelix.com or at Helix Brewing Co., as well as at Helix Sourworks, and that's Sour W-O-R-X. You can find us, theunfilteredgentleman.com or at the unfiltered gentleman on all the social medias, except for Twitter, at Unfiltered Gents. Don't forget to drunk dial us. Leave us your voicemails, 805-538-BEER. It's 2337. And in the meantime, I hope you're all staying hydrated out there. And on that note, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.